Let me start with uh, Pharaoh ne Merneptah, an Egyptian pharaoh in the year 1206 BC. That's the first mention of Israel in any kind of documentation. It's very brief. Pharaoh Merneptah inscribed an inscription which says, I have destroyed Israel. Now, this very intelligent and perceptive audience will probably have noticed that the pharaonic empire no longer exists. <laughs> but Israel does. Defeated, subjugated, dispersed, reconstituted, it's there. So what Shervin really asked me to do is very simple to cover 3,009 years <laughs> in history. The, Yiddish, uh, the Jewish people, or in Yiddish, das Yiddische Volk und was weiter, uh, to describe the development of Jewish-non-Jewish -Jewish relations, anti-Semitism, and the contemporary world in 45 minutes, starting now. <laughs> easy. You see, picking little bits and pieces from here and there and trying to create a kind of a picture. What I want to start with really is the fact that it took the Jewish people a very long time to become a Jewish people. Because the beginnings are very murky and very, very uncertain and, 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 and we don't really know an awful lot a combination of groups probably, some of them escaping from some kind of slavery in Egypt, led perhaps, maybe, possibly, by a person who had the family name of the Egyptian pharaohs, you know, Ra Mses and Tut Mses, and this man was Mses, Moshe, Moses, possibly. And uh, Canaanites, as we heard here in one of the colloquia, uh, escaping from towns in, in in the land of Canaan or Palestine or the land of Israel, it's the same place. And uh, escaping into the woods, into the, into the mountains, and then united with other groups there. And then perhaps uh, organizing itself in some kind of a tribal structure or a kind of a, uh, uh, I don't know, some kind of land. We don't know who was meant by Pharaoh Mer Merneptah anyway. What is Israel? Well, what is a place? Was it a people? Was it a town? What, what was it? We don't really know. And the people who were not included in this group that ultimately formed itself into some kind of a unity, the Moabites, the Edomites, the Ammonites, they were really Hebrew-speaking peoples who, uh, for some reason we don't know, didn't, were not included in this. By the way, very recently in Jordan, in Amman, which, of course, the name Amman is Rabat Amon. That's the capital of the Ammonite kingdom. Now it's the capital of Jordan. You see how time is sort of relative. It's, it's really the present. It's 3,000 years ago, but it's now. And a, an inscription was found on a vase by an Ammonite king whose name was Aminadav. Now, you can't have a more Hebrew name than Aminadav. And the vase was inscribed in ancient Hebrew script. And it's in Hebrew, because the Ammonites spoke Hebrew. And uh, it says that the great prophet, Bilam, in the Bible, but he's also an Ammonite prophet. And he worshipped a god, an Ammonite god who was called, believe it or not, Elohim. It's the same kind of groupings. Hebrew is a dialect of Aramaic. Uh, the Hebrews, Israelites, Judeans were part of this whole structure of the Middle East. And then apparently there was a king, we just know the name, David. Don't really, apart from the Bible, we have no documentation except for one little piece of archaeological remnant where it says, the house of David. And we have no really uh, relevant information about Solomon and so on. But then 
as time goes on, we have much more information because it comes nearer to the time when all this stuff was written down and collected, and maybe from ancient manuscripts, who knows. And the northern kingdom was destroyed, right? We all know that, Israel. And the ten tribes were dispersed. All these legends about them are nonsense. They, they just don't exist. And the two tribes that were left, a tiny little area, you know, Judea, it's, it's probably less than metropolitan Detroit. And uh, that's where the uh, kingdom of Judah uh, was founded and developed and so on, maintaining itself by the skin of its teeth. And it had relations with the outside world, of course, with the big empires, with the Syrians and the Babylonians and to the north, with the Egyptians to the south. They usually r picked the wrong allies and were defeated there and here and again and again and again and so on. And they maintained themselves for a time. And then you have, you see, a culture developing, a civilization with tremendous internal uh, problems and, and, and arguments and so on. We know only one side. We know the prophets, wonderful people. Now, they were acting against the false prophets. Now, I'm absolutely positive that the false prophets didn't call themselves false prophets. <laughs> and we don't know what they said. Well, basically, uh, as Yaakov Malkin taught me, uh, uh, for hundreds of years in the temple in Jerusalem, there was the statue of, the, of a Phoenician goddess, Asherah, Astarte. And there was a struggle between those who wanted the Jehovah God to become the real big God of this particular group and then universalize that God created heaven and earth and so on. And that came later. It was a struggle. In the end, they won. And a Jewish civilization began to develop, or continue to develop. So it's not that we appeared at one point and there we were. No, it's a slow development. And you see, then we create legends about ourselves. All ethnic groups, nationalities, create legends which they ardently believe in. The legend that we were exiled from our country. So the first Babylonian exile, if you look at it carefully and read the Bible carefully, I think you will realize that there was a small number of aristocrats and, and probably the army, whatever there was there, and bureaucrats who were deported by Nebuchadnezzar to Babylon. Probably about 17,000 or thereabouts. And the rest stayed behind. And they, they stayed behind. They were there. And that's the exile. And that's it. And then they stayed there, and then they came back. Did they come back? Nonsense. A few of them came back. A couple of thousand, maybe 3,000 came back. And the rest stayed there. And you have the beginnings of a diaspora. And then comes the second temple and the whole business, the Persian rule and the Greek rule. So, and then come the Romans. And in the, mean, in the meantime, you have an independence, the Hasmonean kingdom which did what? It converted, in other words, it forced Judaism by brutal force on the surrounding peoples, on the Edomites, on the Galileans and others, who in the meantime had ceased being identified with the Jews. So who are we really? Well, we are a mixture like everyone else. We are just as pure-blooded as any Detroit mixed poodle. Uh, and you, you just look at us, I mean, you can see. But the culture, the civilization is there. There's, there's a core there that develops in different directions and in contradictions and so on. But that core develops. And that's the fascinating thing about us. Now, the relations begin to sour. The relations in Babylon didn't sour. We have no evidence whatsoever of any persecution or murder or pogroms until, in fact, the Arab conquest in the seventh century of Mesopotamia. The Jews did not, they were not evicted. In fact, there was a small, short period of time when there was a kind of a Jewish kingdom there. 
They were agriculturalists, they were traders, they were the craftsmen, they had everything that other people did around them. They maintained themselves as separate groups, separate civilizations. I don't know whether they were loved. I don't think they were hated. I think they were accepted. They lived there for a very, very long time, well over a thousand years. In Alexandria, which was founded, you know, by Alexander the Great, obviously, in the, at the end of the fourth century BC, and there Jews developed a Jewish, big Jewish community. Where did it come from? Well, it came, perhaps, probably, very possibly, a small number of uh, Jews or Judeans who escaped from the destruction of the first temple, including Jeremiah who went to Egypt and uh, settled there. There must have been others like that who then went on. And then people converted to Judaism. Judaism was a proselytizing faith. There was a group of Jewish soldiers who settled in the south of Egypt, what is now known as the Elephantine Island. They built a replica of the Jerusalem temple there. They were soldiers, they defended the late pharaonic empire from the Nubians in the south. But I think many of them were people who had converted to Judaism because Judaism offered a solution to all kinds of problems that people had with themselves, with their faiths. There were no secular Jews or others. It's a later development. But in this uh, multiple, very beautiful pagan world, there was a, there was dissatisfaction with the answers. And here was a clear, developing a clear answer. And uh, these people, Jews in Alexandria, were attacked by the Egyptians and the Greeks in the city. And we have evidence of an ideology developed that is pre-Christian, pre-Christian. Uh, why do these people act differently from the, from the rest? We can't invite them to eat, to share our food with them. They won't eat it because they've got these funny dietary laws. And then they, then they have this day, one day a week they don't work. I mean, that's silly not to work. How can you build, you know, pyramids or whatever <laughs> when you have one day off? And these people have been invented not only that day for ordinary free people, but for slaves as well, and for animals, and even for the land. And you know, it's not even a Jewish invention. Nothing that is traditionally Jewish, or very little, is actually comes from us. It's an adaptation of other people's ideas. Monotheism is Egyptian in the 15th century. Pharaoh Echnaton, who wanted to have the sun god as the only god in the world, who created the world, and so on. And the Sabbath is a Babylonian thing. It's, uh, Shabbatu is a Babylonian word. There it was only for the aristocracy, you see, who had the day off. The Jews then broadened the idea. And this statement in the Bible, which can be interpreted as a, an opposition in principle to slavery. It's not, well, you can get around it, you know. But in principle, it's not a good idea. <laughs> to oppose slavery in the ancient world meant to oppose civilization. These Jews were reactionary, real reactionary. I mean, how can you develop civilization without slaves? And this culture is different. It's not better, it's not worse. Had they stayed in their little place with agricultural uh, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, working on these terraces with, with horses and oxen and, and donkeys and whatever, it's acrobatics, agricultural acrobatics. You, you, can, you can look at the terraces to this day. When you go up from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, it's all, it's all over the place. These are these ancient terraces, thousands of years old. Had they stayed there, well, there would have been another oddity. There are plenty of oddities in the world of groups that believe differently from others. 
But these people spread. Now, why did they spread? The Romans exiled the Jews from the land of Israel, and ever since then we've been in diaspora. You've learned all that in, in school and so on. It's not true. <laughs> the, Ro the Romans exiled 25 to 30,000 Jews who opposed them as slaves into the Roman Empire, and they were bought free, most of them, by other Jews in communities who were, who were already living in all kinds of places. One uh, uh, type of demography, I mean, it's, uh, these are sort of guesses, uh, that at the beginning of the first century of the uh, first Christian century, there were about four million Jews. And then at the end of the century, they had multiplied by at least a factor of 100%. In other words, eight million. Some people talk about 10 million. I don't know whether that's very uh, logical. But a high proportion, maybe up to eight, nine, ten percent of the inhabitants of the Roman Empire were Jews. They were a real danger to Rome and they rose in rebellion. There's no joking matter. So when the rebellion was crushed, these, you know, the ones who really fought were taken to slaves to Rome, to, to, to the various slave markets in Rome. What about the other millions? They stayed. There was a Jewish majority in the land of Canaan, Palestine, Israel, until the until the Arab conquest. And in fact, don't tell it to anyone. <laughs> but the Palestinian Arabs are largely the descendant of Jews who converted to Islam after the conquest <laughs> by the Arabs. <laughs> Which doesn't mean that the others weren't Jews. They too were. But then you see, you don't multiply within 70, 80, 100 years a population in those days simply by natural increase. And certainly not when the, you know, the political catastrophe of the destruction of the temple. So it's quite clear that uh, there was a tremendous movement of conversion. And it's documented in Roman writings. Because, you know, the ladies, the aristocratic ladies of Rome converting to Judaism, it was a terrible danger to the Roman Empire. And the Roman writers write about it. So we are also descendants of Romans, in case you didn't know. And yet, you see, it carries on. It's, this, it's a tradition. You are accepted into a tradition that you were not born into. Tell that today to the orthodox, conservative, and reform people here, okay? That you don't have to be born Jewish to be Jewish. It's an old tradition, very old tradition. So where does anti-Semitism come from? There's an article, I spoke about it to Felix Posen as he was coming this afternoon. This was written by a good friend of ours, one of the great, really great contemporary Hebrew writers, Aleph Bet Yoshua, known to most of us as Bully Yoshua. And Bully wrote an article, which is going to be published in Hebrew within the next, what, few weeks. I'm sure it's going to be translated into English. And he takes the book of Esther in the Bible as the starting point of a discussion of anti-Semitism. It's the only sensible thing to do. The story is well known. A Jewish concubine of a Persian king by the name of Ahasuerus Achashverosh, who has an uncle by the name of Mordechai, who guides the concubine by the name of Esther, who prevents by interceding with the king the total annihilation, extermination of the Jewish people in this vast Persian empire. Okay. We know the story. And then the result, of course, is that the Jews take an awful, bloody revenge. And they kill their enemies. It's pure invention. There never was a king by the name of Achashverosh. The Persians were the only major empire in the ancient world that actually supported the Jews. 
Not only Cyrus, you know, the Persian king who had permitted the Jews to go back to Jerusalem after the Babylonian exile, but the whole Persian period is a, is a period of Jewish uh, flourishing. Where did they take this idea from? There was no person by the name of Haman, Haman. Esther, Esther is Ashtoreth, it's a Phoenician goddess. What does a nice Jewish girl in a Persian, you know, monarchy <laughs> with the name of a Phoenician goddess and her uncle Mordechai Marduk, that's the Babylonian god to whom human sacrifices were given. Come on. Two pagan figures dressed up as Jews, rescuing Jews from a non-existent Persian king? Where does this story come from? And I think the story, I completely agree with uh, uh, Bully uh, you know, all academics say, I said it before you. I, I said it before him. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's clear to me, it's clear to me that here you have a fear, a terrible fear, expressed in something that in, was included in the Bible, although Jehovah isn't mentioned there at all. There's no God there. No God in the book of Esther. The Jews were saved not by God, but by Marduk, a Babylonian God to whom human sacrifices were given. It's a nightmare translated into literary language. Beautiful book. Lovely. Terrific. And people read it, you know, in, in synagogues, and they do, you know, go... <laughs> It's the fear of annihilation. And why does the non-existent Haman, Haman, want to destroy the Jews in the Persian Empire? Because they don't observe the religions, customs of the king and the people. Because they are different. And that is the origin of anti-Semitism. Not that the Jews are better or worse, or because they occupy some central positions in the Roman Empire, which they didn't, or the Egyptian Empire, because they are traders. Well, others were traders too. But because there was a cultural difference. And then you come, you have Christianity on top of that. And uh, it becomes Christianity is an offshoot of Judaism. And it's an internal quarrel, it's a family quarrel, which becomes a violent enmity. And in order to justify uh, Christianity, Christianity turns against the Jews with the, some of the first church fathers, Oregon, Cyprian, John Chrysostom of the Golden Tongue in uh, Constantinople, now Istanbul, of course, in the first centuries of the Christian era. And when you read that stuff, it's the Stürmer. It's the Stürmer. And yet you see, Christianity never, never planned the genocide of the Jews. Because it needed the Jews. Because you see, if you create a religion that is based on an ancient religion which you reject, then if you base it on that, you can't, you can't do away with it. Yes, you can persecute them, you can, you can uh, discriminate against them, you can, uh, you can uh, uh, deport them, you, 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 can't, you mustn't kill them. They killed, but it was against the theology, it was against the religion. So am I talking about the relationship between Jews and non-Jews as anti-Semitism? Yes and no. No, because the idea which was, uh, uh, you know, that the Jews, that the history of the Jews is the history of their persecutions, was exploded by no less a historian than Salo Baron, living in America, born in Europe, living in America, 
who coined the expression that he was against the lacrimose interpretation of Jewish history. It's not a history of tears only. And in fact, I would argue, and I know that there are others who disagree with me, that uh, most of the time, in most of the places, Jews were not persecuted, Jews were not killed, Jews were not expelled, Jews were accepted. Sometimes were, they were invited, sometimes they were welcome, much more often they were simply accepted for what they were and left to their own devices. I gave you the example of uh, Babylon, of Mesopotamia. I could give you others. There's a place in uh, the mountains of the Caucasus called uh, the Republic of Georgia. There have been Jews there for well over 2,000 years. Now, there have been individual uh, Georgian anti-Semites, of course, the most famous one of whom is Joseph Vissarionovich Jugashvili, better known as Stalin. And there were others like that. But there was never a movement against Jews in Georgia. There was never any anti-Semitic propaganda. There was never any persecution. The Jews didn't intermarry. They, more or less, they, they stayed where, who they were. And they were accepted as part, part of the landscape for hundreds, in fact, thousands of years. And Georgia, in what? the 5th, 6th century became a Christian people. So you have a Christian people among whom the Jews were living without any particular trouble. India. Jews went to India from Babylon, Mesopotamia. We don't know exactly when. And probably towards the end of the Second Temple, maybe a little bit later. And they settled in Cochin, on the southwestern coast of India. There was never, never, never any kind of anti-Jewish movement in India. Never. There was a minority that was sitting there. Nobody, well, it, they paid their taxes and uh, they were part of the turbulence of these areas, sure, but they were never persecuted because they were Jews. Never. And there are other cases like that. So you see, you have a long history of a development that mixes uh, the accidents of uh, collective life. And throughout that period, each group, each Jewish group, develops in accordance with the culture of the host country, and yet maintains its own tradition, which it brought with it. So when you talk about the Jews of Poland, for instance, until the 16th century, there was no persecution of Jews in Poland, but Poland in the 16th century entered into a, a long period of terrible crises and occupations by, 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 by the Moscovites, by the Swedes, by the Prussians, and so on and so forth. And the internal crisis turned some people, but not so much the Poles as the Ukrainians, against the Jews. Polish anti-Semitism arose in the 19th century only. A movement? There was a Catholic Church, sure. But the Catholic Church's theological anti-Semitism <coughs> was held back by the aristocracy and the kings because they needed the Jews. They were useful. And in many cases, especially when you come to the Cossack invasions of the 17th century into Poland, the Jews and the Poles defended the cities together against the Cossacks. Polish survivors of the Holocaust will tell you sometimes that the Poles were worse than the Germans. They were not. Which doesn't mean to say that there wasn't a tremendous amount of anti-Semitism in Poland. But Polish anti-Semitism is relatively new. And in Poland, indeed, the main factor, the major factor turning the Poles against the Jews on the basis of a theological anti-Semitism which was propagated by the Catholic Church for centuries, were economic issues. And you have it in, you see, in different forms, in different places. 
Now, what happened in the United States? You see, I'm jumping a little bit from the period of the Book of Esther to the United States. It's when you look, when you when you really deal with uh, history, not only Jewish history, but especially when you deal with Jewish history, you realize, and this is sort of in parenthesis now, you realize that you are not dealing with a distant past. There is no such thing. People are the same today as they were 3,000 years ago. The same kind of motivations, power, wealth, status. We're active then and are active now. The same kind of emotions. Yes, they are changed, sure. But they are not so significant as to prevent me from saying that there is our concept of time is mistake. We measure time according to our lifespan. There are 70 years, 80 years, whatever. But history moves much, much slower than that on the one hand and much faster on the other hand. It's called dialectics, contradictions that do or do not resolve themselves. And if you don't like Marxist dialectics, go to the Greeks. It's the same thing. And I think that if you don't think dialectically, you don't have an understanding of the time element. When I'm talking about the book of Esther, I'm talking about 2003. When I'm talking about Poland in the 19th century, I'm talking about the early church, church father. We live in the same world. We have our little, you know, chronological divisions. They are very often mistaken and misunderstood. Let me go back to what I was talking about. That there is this dialectical development. On the one hand, yes, you do have persecutions and you do have expulsions and you do have all kinds of very bad things. And yes, on the other hand, you have long periods of time when people live in a place, Poland, Poland. The Hebrew word for Poland is Paulin, which means in Hebrew, here you will spend the night. Here you settle. Paulin. And Poland was Paulin for the Jews for hundreds of years. Less than in Mesopotamia, but still hundreds of years. Now, you come then to the modern period, to the very modern. And you will expect me, because that is, after all, my major topic, to talk about the Holocaust. But I'm not going to do that. Because it will be included in a few remarks that I'm going to make now, by implication. You see, the extreme forms of Jew hatred arise in modern times, and they are based on ancient ideas translated into a new environment. National socialist propaganda against the Jews has no element in it that cannot be traced from hundreds of years before that. But there is a new idea there, and that really is new. And that is racism. Because we have had in human history any number of cases where one social class wanted to replace another social class. Where the bourgeoisie in the France of the late 18th century wanted to replace the feudal order. Where the German peasants of 1525 wanted to destroy the feudal system in Germany in favor of the peasants. Well, any number of cases like that. What's communism after all? Not communism that became uh, the uh, uh, propaganda of a uh, uh, imperialist Russia. But the original idea to replace one social class by another. We've had that one before. Religions, one religion replacing the other, one nationality replacing the other, one empire replacing the other. How many times have we had that? Never before 
has there been an attempt to reorganize humanity according to what they call races? There are no races. It's a pseudoscience. We all come from East Africa originally. All humanity originates in the Rift Valley there, in Eastern Africa. Now, some of us have spent the too much time in northern climates, so the pigmentation has become too pale. But uh, basically, we are all Africans, originally. There is no such thing as a race. On the basis of this pseudoscience, these people wanted to reorganize not Germany, not Europe, humanity, all of humanity. Not immediately, by the way, in the 19, early 1930s. But when you look, in the 1941, 42, 43, 44, you find it there. And that's new. That's new. And there, you see, is a tremendous problem. Not only for Jews, but first of all for Jews. Because Jews are Satan. Jews are the enemies of humanity. And then you have the United States. But the United States is the exact opposite. For the first time in Jewish history, the Jews have not only become accepted as individuals and as groups, but they have become part of the ruling class in a major empire, the American empire of today, for the first time. To a certain extent, that up to a point, you can take England as an example, too, but it's, it's much weaker. In America, there is, of course, anti-Semitism, yes, but it's marginal. It's, it's a few percentage points. Of course, American Jews, if you turn to American Jews, um, uh, anti-Semitism around the corner, we are threatened with another Holocaust in America, all this kind of nonsense. In fact, uh, American Jewry has exactly the problem that <laughs> Sherwin mentioned at the beginning. The... Uh, Embarrass the richesse, the, 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 the fact that you, 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 it's, it's so good, so why should you remain Jewish? But there's pressure from the sides, not anti Semitic pressure necessarily, pressure. Now, this is new. So there are two new elements a negative one and a positive one. And we don't know how to handle these things, we are totally at loss. Because we are ruled internally, Jewishly, by a, an establishment that, to use a, an expression originating in Brooklyn, they don't know from nothing. <laughs> what they, 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 you know, they, it's all, it's a quarrel between orthodox, conservative, reform, reconstructionist maybe. Uh, <laughs> In Hebrew, you have a, we have a wonderful saying. Uh, it's an argument about how many R's, the, the letter R, are there in the name Cohen. <laughs> That's, it's it's this, this type of argument, you see? Uh, totally unrealistic. Because, as uh, people know, uh, up to a half in Israel, much more than half, of uh, Jews do not follow religious observances. And uh, so they are left alone. There, there's nobody to look after them. There's nobody to deal with them. There's nobody to, to turn to them. And that is a real danger. And so within the positive, you have a very strong negative. In the negative, in the Holocaust, you had a small positive. The positive was that there were rescuers, people who cared people who rescued and showed that humanity has a choice between different types of behavior. And then you come to the post-Holocaust world. And in the post-Holocaust world, and one can prove that, there have been four waves of anti-Semitism, including the present one. Each one starting without any prior, real prior warning, all over the so-called Western world, expressing itself in, well, uh, defacement of, uh, of 
cemeteries, of, of, of uh, synagogues beating up, and media, and propaganda, and, and leaflets, and that sort of thing. And uh, uh, it's quite clear today that uh, these four waves of anti-Semitism were not necessarily caused by any economic displacement, not an economic crisis, which is what we learned when we were young, you know, at least I did that anti-Semitism is called by economic crisis. Nonsense. Some of it is and some of it isn't. And when you look carefully at these four waves, you find that they not only go up, they also go down. The present one clearly, clearly was triggered by the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Clearly. But it wasn't caused by it because Underneath the, uh, you know, the surface, there is this lava that is burning, boiling, waiting to explode. And uh, whenever the crust is weak, it explodes. The crust can be cultural problems, economic problems, political problems. But it's there. The British were... In England, the uh, media anti-Semitism, the intellectual anti-Semitism, is probably worse than anywhere else. They did not react to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and then invented anti-Semitism. No, it was there. It was underground. And it was triggered. Anti-Semitism, anti-Zionism? Well, you know, Zionism means that you think that the uh, Jewish people are a people around the world, those of them who want to be part of it, and that their political and hopefully perhaps uh, their cultural center is in Israel. Well, that's it. And then you have all kinds of interpretation how, the, how that should be dealt with. So if you are anti-Zionist, you are against the independence of the Jews in that particular country. But then you say everybody else has the right to independence. Everybody else has the right to self-definition, except for the Jews. In other words, that anti-Zionism is anti-Semitic, very clearly. But we mix these things up. And when we talk about anti-Semitism, we include in it when somebody puts up a notice in, uh, in the hotel that he owns, that only Christian customers are accepted, and somebody who wants to kill Jews, there's a vast difference between these two people. It's not the same thing. If somebody dislikes me, it's different from if he wants to murder me. But we include everything under the same kind of thing. You see, we throw everything into the same pot of anti-Semitism. We are totally, uh, uh, we are totally wrong. And then the concept of anti-Semitism was invented in 1879 by an anti-Semite, the term a German journalist by the name of Wilhelm Marr, and what he meant was anti-Jewishness. But he didn't want to use the old term because the old term was identified with Christian anti-Jewishness, and he was anti-Christian. So he was looking for a pseudo-scientific word, which term, which wouldn't mention Jews, he might not know Jews, right? And uh, would be accepted. And the term is sen senseless because there's no Semitism that you can be anti to. Semites are a group of languages. Eritreans speak a Semitic language. In Tigray, in Ethiopia, they speak a Semitic language. Semites are not an ethnic unit. Indo-Europeans are not an ethnic unit. They are Indo-European languages, they are Semitic languages. The term is nonsense. But we use it. And we use it wrongly. We talk about anti-Semitism, I did just now, from earliest times to today. Wrong. Anti-Semitism really ought to be used only for the modern, nationalistic, racist kind of anti-Jewishness. <coughs> but everyone, including myself, misuses anti-Semitism. At least I do it consciously. <laughs> and modern anti-Semitism is a mixture of these things. It's not, you know, people say, is this racist, nationalist anti-Semitism, or is this traditional Christian anti-Semitism? You can't differentiate that, that well. These, 
anti-Jewish sentiments are now a mixture because post-Holocaust is influenced by what happened during the Holocaust by National Socialist ideology. You can't differentiate anymore that clearly. Yes, you can say this is more traditional and this is more racist, sure. But this clean differentiation cannot be made. Nowhere is this clearer than in radical Islam today. Because you see, people talk about anti-Semitism in America. What they mean is European anti-Semitism. What they mean is this fourth wave I was talking about. But that wave is going to pass. I endanger myself by a prediction, just like the others did. Sooner or later, maybe later, it'll go down. We are not threatened with another holocaust or another major persecution in America or the West. We are not. Which doesn't mean to say we don't have to fight this. Of course we do. If we don't, if we don't fight this, what will the Jewish organizations in America do? <laughs> I mean, if, you know, ADL exists because it is useful in a situation where the American people are overwhelmingly not anti-Semitic. And, and, they, and they are useful because those elements of anti-Semitism that do exist have to be fought and the ADL is very good at that. And in other, in other countries in the West. The ADL is not much use in Pakistan. <laughs> nor is the American Jewish Committee. Nor is the Jewish Agency. Certainly not the Israeli government, which is totally hopeless. <laughs> so what you, have, what you have is a new situation where there are two types of anti-Semitism next to each other. A mild one, relatively mild one, which we all deal with and we all write big thick books about and so on. It's the Western anti-Semitism. It's there, it has to be fought, it's dangerous. Okay, fine. It's a snake, a snake in front of us. And behind us, there stands a huge fellow with a terribly big club, radical Islam. Radical Islam is not Islam. It's a mutation of Islam. Like the Aryan nations in America, a mutation of Christianity, in the, the identity churches, and so on. But uh, radical Islam was founded in 1928 in Egypt. And it developed because of frustration in the Muslim world. They fell behind. Why? They were the largest, biggest, most advanced civilization in the Middle Ages. The European civilization largely stems from the Islamic influence. And they fell behind. Why? Well, the answer is very simple, really. The answer is that they never developed a kind of individualist attitudes, a kind of uh, uh, development towards intellectualism and middle class and therefore capitalism that the West developed. And why didn't they do that? Because they were ruled by autocracies that relied on reactionary religious establishments and they were fortified by Western imperialism that came in. And Western imperialists utilized the autocracies that were there that were supported by the religious conservatives and this combination did not permit the development of a middle class in a modern, modern civilization. And there's a terrible frustration there. Why should a Muslim world be any worse than the Japanese or the South Koreans or the Taiwanese on Singapore, now India and tomorrow China? You see, and the frustration then goes to a very simple answer. The reason why we fell back is because we didn't obey God, Allah. Now, if we obey exactly, literally, what is written in the Quran, what is written in the interpretations of the Quran, in Hadith, what is written in the halakha, in the Muslim halakha, the Muslim religious law, the Sharia, then God will be with us. Now, what is the aim of God? Clear to every radical Muslim to rule the world, to convert the world into an Islamic utopia, peaceful, friendly, ruled by clerics. Anyone who doesn't accept Islam can 
can live under Islam as a subjugated third class citizenry, yes. But those who don't will be killed. And that's stated explicitly black on white repeatedly every week. The latest uh, expressions are uh, four weeks ago on an Islamic, uh, radical Islamic website. We have to kill four million Americans out of whom two millions have to be children as a revenge for what America did to us. That's genocide. Kill all the Jews. No longer the, do the Jews have a choice of becoming subjects of an Islamic rule where they will enjoy second or third class citizenship. Kill all the Jews. There's no differentiation between Zionist Jews and non-Zionist Jews. There's no differentiation between Israel and the diaspora. Now, it's slated for not destruction, for murder. There's a parallel between that and National Socialism, and if you like, Soviet Communism as well. Because radical Islam is anti-national. It opposes Arab national states. Did you know that? Arab national states have to be abolished. Islamic states, part of a worldwide Islamic confederation, have to come in their stead. And the first targets, of course, are non-radical Muslims, naturally, and then the Jews, and then the Americans, and then all the, all the other Western nations, and then the Hindus, because the Hindus are pagans. They're not even Christians or Jews. And unless they accept Islam, a statement on television 10 days ago have to be killed. Pakistan is an excellent example. There are no Jews in Pakistan. Well, there was one, and he was killed, Daniel Pearl. Pakistan is an anti-Semitic country to the bone. There are no Jews there. There never were any Jews there of any, in any number, you know, here one, there one. You don't have to have Jews to, have a, to be anti-Semitic. Uh, the Jews be, have become a symbol of something you attack. It's not the only country quite a number of them. Now, what do you do about it? Well, the Americans are totally mistaken in my view. The American pursuit of terrorism, yeah, it's got to be done, sure. But they do nothing else. And you can't defeat terrorism by force of arms. I know that from my own country. You can't defeat terrorists. By moving in. You can't move in. It's nonsense. So you have to de do other things. You have to educate. You have to make propaganda. You have to utilize the fact that there are millions upon millions upon millions of non radical Muslims, of anti radical Muslims. And persuade them to use the most modern technical means to counteract that propaganda. From a Jewish point of view, I think that we are doing the wrong things internally and externally. There are two centers for strategic studies in Israel, one in Tel Aviv, Tel Aviv University, and the other one, a relatively new one in Herzliya. And they are serious centers. They, are, you know, they do excellent work. But they are concentrated on Israel. They are concentrated on the security and political problems of Israel. And yes, they deal also with the diaspora, so they deal with anti-Semitism. And, and yes, and how, how, how do Jews feel and so on. That's not what I mean when I say strategic studies. The position of the Jewish people in the world, and the world related to itself and to the Jewish people. The fact that in the Western world, Europe and the United States. There's a decline in populations. In this country, you would have a decline in population were it not for the massive immigration from South America and Central America. And in Europe, the number of people is 
uh, growing less and less. In another 10, 20 years, there will be many less Russians and Poles and Germans and Czechs and, and French and British and Italians and Spaniards and Portuguese. It will be an aging population. Who will support them? They have to have immigration. But India and China are developing countries very fast. The, the, the rate of uh, the uh, increase in the GNP in India this year is estimated to be between 4 and 7 percent. The immigration will come from the poor, poor, poor countries, from the Muslim world. There are now 18 million Muslims in Europe, a tiny minority of whom are radical Muslims, but it's increasing. And if you have this going on and on, you have to have some kind of a vision in front of your eyes, what to do about it. And we are part of that. The number of Jews is not increasing, to put it mildly. Less than 13 million. In a situation like that, strategic Jewish thinking would say, we are in an endangered world. We have to be partners in any kind of effort that will maintain democracy, which is a weak reed in the world. We have to be partners not in using the present military superiority that we have, but in using that as a backdrop to efforts that will change the situation. And strategic Jewish thinking, to my mind, and I'm expressing my own view, it's the view of an individual, and I have yet to see any large number of my colleagues who will support it. So don't rely on what I say. But uh, in my view, the Jewish people getting smaller has to have a number of strategic answers. One is to open up, to increase our numbers, just like we did in the first century of the Christian era. Accept people who want to be Jewish. They may be crazy that they want to be Jewish, but there are people like that. And the more the better. Be pluralistic, absorb Incre increase by including, not excluding. You want to be ultra-Orthodox? Lovely. Be ultra-Orthodox by all means. But if you're not, you're just as welcome. In Israel, the idea of occupying the West Bank in a country that in another 10 to 15 years will have an Arab majority. I did not fight the war of in, in the war of independence to live in an Arab country. I want a Jewish country. Only be reached, only can be done in an Israel that excludes the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, excludes Arab Jerusalem, and thereby creates the situ a situation where possibly, maybe, a uh, life can be arranged together with the neighbors. But the way we are going about it now is totally against our own interests. Now, the diaspora, the diaspora is contracting. In another 20 years, there will be a Jewish majority. The, most of the Jew, majority of the Jewish people are going to live in Israel, not because they immigrate there, but because elsewhere they are diminishing. The only place where the Jews are increasing, natural increases, in Israel. But without the diaspora, Israel cannot exist. So there is a strategic element in the desire of any sensible Jewish politician, in my mind, to increase the diaspora, to make it stronger. Not militarily, and not by eating kosher. <laughs> and unless we do that, we put ourselves in a terrible danger. So let me conclude, only very few people have uh, 
during my lecture here have uh, been sort of showing signs of uh, falling asleep. At this point, I think I should end. And I would like to end with a hope. It's a good Jewish custom. You know, you, you say it's terrible, it's awful, so on. in the end it's going to be uh, Beseder. It's going to be okay. <laughs> well, I'm not sure that it's going to be okay, but there's a possibility. The possibility is to strengthen those, not only amongst the non-religious, also amongst the religious Jews, who understand that we have to have global thinking, that we have to plan our future that we have to have political savvy so that we can plan options for what to do. Politicians that will understand that we have to collaborate with others on the basis of the understanding of certain values that we want to present. And the values may be very vague. But it, they mean basically the individual freedom and the possibility of development and equal chances. I don't want, Shervin, I don't want love. Love is a very private feeling. I want understanding. I want something where people in their own self-interest feel that they have something in common with us. And therefore, not because of our beautiful eyes, want to collaborate, and there are people like that, collaborate with us for a future that hopefully will be better, not only for humanity, it's a very large word, but for the small people, less than 13 million. If I want a Jew, but with my views, I would probably convert to a secular Judaism. Because it's one, a wonderful people, terribly exciting, awful, an awful people, a disgusting people, a wonderful people, us. <laughs>